Emma Hardy, MP, welcome to Hope and Anchor. Welcome to the virtual table. We like to imagine we're at a pub table together, but obviously we're on Zoom. But you know, we're having a good we're having a good conversation. So so glad to have you with us today. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I have my coffee with me. We're in our virtual pub table. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little early. We're, it's about eleven o'clock in the morning when we're recording this interview, so it might be a little early to be at the pub. But you know, who knows? You'd be there with a cup of coffee. It's great. It is a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> it is a Friday. Uh, we like to ask all of our guests, um, where are you in the world and what's your local? That could be your local pub or your local coffee shop or your local 12-step recovery meeting or your local dog park or your local parents and toddlers group, whatever it is. It's a place where you go on a regular basis in your community to hang out, to meet new friends and to see old friends. So where are you in the world and what's your local? Oh, Right now, I'm in Hull. I'm in my office, uh, my constituency office. In terms of where I go, I suppose, for my local, there's a few different places. There's a really nice uh, craft beer pub in Hessel called the Poor House, which is the P-O-U-R Poor House, <laughs> which sells all different kinds of uh, all different kinds of beers and craft beers. And that one's quite a nice place to just go and catch up with people. I don't get to go <laughs> as often as I would like, unfortunately. <laughs> but it is it is really nice. It's a really nice space. And there used to be, which I'm hoping it's going to reopen, in the local Methodist church. You used to have a cafe at the front of it, and that was a great place to go and pop in on a Saturday morning when you were sort of doing your shopping and getting bits and pieces. Because whenever I went in there, you guarantee you know most of the people in the room. So it always felt like quite a a warm, friendly place to be. So I'm looking forward to that place being reopened as well. It's so nice, isn't it? I mean, I know when I go to my favorite places, it's just like hear your name called out across the pub or across the cafe, or do you call out someone else's name? Oh, Janet, oh, Tom, I haven't seen you in a while. Just that kind of, we've missed that, haven't we, over the pandemic of that that sense of connection to other folks? Oh, absolutely. Because it, it, it is so different when you see people face to face and you do get a, a, a greater sense of how they are and how things are going on. And, and we could see this when, when the pubs did reopen, the number of people outside shivering in blankets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just feel so desperate to be out there I went to see my sister and we went out for food and it was raining and we were in blankets and we were shivering on the side of the road but it was just the best time because we'd just not been out and seen each other so we loved it and um because people like that they like and sharing food is and sharing a drink is part of that connection isn't it eating together spending time together Absolutely. So, it's been good. so good so you were um I was uh reading about you and hearing about you you were you were a nursery worker back in the day you were a teacher then you worked i think for a teachers union now you're an mp you've served previously in the shadow cabinet i mean amazing combination of jobs um and you're still so young your whole life is ahead of you still i'm always curious though like why people do what they do we could go on to your wikipedia page your your parliament page and read like your cv which is fabulous but um I'm just curious, when you think about your life work, your work right now, what is it? What's the passion? What's the, what's the anger? What's the question? What's the thing that gets you out of bed in the morning or keeps you up dreaming and, and, and um, strategizing at night? What's the why beneath your work? I think it's that thing, isn't it? Of, I think it was driven, my move to politics was driven quite by anger and frustration in a lot of ways and I've often said I would have stayed as a primary school teacher because little kids are hilarious <laughs> anyone who works with small children no they are just so funny and so much fun and I did love all of that but when everything changed I, I just didn't feel that the change was the right was the right thing and I've always wanted to work in something where you feel like you're making a difference and you really do as a nursery teacher and a teacher you really are making a difference to the little people that are, are with you and in your class and and when so when things started to change, I felt like I felt like I was doing them an injustice. I was doing something that I that I believed to be wrong, the wrong way of teaching, the wrong curriculum, and, and that was being sent down from us. So that's how I moved into politics. And I think it is that sense of 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 injustice and trying to trying to make things better. I think it's that idea of you try and leave the world a little better than when you found it, if mm -hmm. you can. I'm not sure we're succeeding right now. You know, we, we worry about climate change and we worry about many things. But I think that's the idea. And, and I think it is that sense of just trying to do, uh, you know, trying to make a positive difference. Which sounds so cheesy, I know. And I know every MP says the same thing that we just, but it, it, 
but something has to and and I think it's that you know something has to make you put up with the negative side of the job you know the abuse or the people who get very cross and very angry something has to and I think it is that sense of, of we're trying to trying to make a difference where we can you said you, you hope to like leave the world a little better than when you left it. I'm just curious if you could sort of fast forward 30 or 40 or 50 years when you're sitting down and retiring or whatever, I don't know. And, and, and it's, it's your retirement uh, due. And, and what would, what would you want people to say about you at that retirement due? I think, and well, ideally you'd want to do something about reducing the levels of inequality that we have. I'd like to think that people would say, she tried. And I do say to people when they come to me for help, you know, I can't promise to solve your problem. I can promise I'll try, but I can't promise to solve it. That's that's all we can do is, is try. And I hope I hope that people will say that, you know, she tried to she tried to, um, you know, make the world a better place. And um, and then sometimes she succeeded and sometimes she didn't. But that's, you know, like, that would be an honest appraisal, I think. Um, but, you know, you've, you've just got to keep trying. And I think that sense of when you. I, you know, I said, I think I said in a speech once I did a qu- quoting, I think Chumba Wumba, by saying, you know, you're knocked down, but you get back up again. And that's all you can, that's what you've got to keep doing, uh, you know, because there's lots of people who need an awful lot of help at the moment. Amen. Chumba Wumba, that's this, the song of many of us who were raised in the 80s and 90s, right? That kind of, <laughs> yes, yes, we can, we can do it, we can get up again. Um, yeah. I was on your social media uh, pages and your Instagram profile says in the header, mom of two, social justice campaigner, ex-teacher, Methodist, and then labor, labor, labor MP for Hull West and Hessel. I just love that combination of identities. All of them are you. And of course, you know, as a Methodist, it's wonderful to see, to see that Methodist love there. Um, many politicians, I think, especially in British and European kind of political traditions, are quite private about their faith or their spirituality or religious beliefs or, or lack thereof. And I'm curious, why have you chosen to be so kind of deliberately public about being a person of faith and, and a proud Methodist at that? I, I think because it's just part, it's part of me and it would feel almost like I was ashamed if I was trying to, trying to hide it. I mean, it's on my Twitter profile as well. I mean, it's not, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't, try and convert everyone I meet or, or, or but it, it's there and it's part of me and it's part of my identity and it's part of who I am and, and I feel in the same way you know of being having two daughters as being one one of my identities is I'm a mom and, and sister and, and and I feel proud of being an ex-teacher I think that's a strong part of my identity and, and being a Methodist is part of that is part of of who I am so why would I be why would I hide it hiding it would almost feel like I'm ashamed of it and I'm not it's part you know it's, it's part of my identity and I feel quite proud actually in saying you know, we look at what the Methodist Church is doing and what it's involved in and how it works on the ground and how it's trying to support people in so many uh, different ways in dealing with uh, inequality I mean it's great it's great to be a Methodist <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> it's you know it's one you know you hear it sometimes in political circles uh, not supposed to talk about our faith in political circles, but you'll also hear from some some Christians, good people, who will say, you know, we're Christians, we're supposed to talk about faith and God, we're not supposed to talk about politics or talk about social social engagement. What do you say to folks who might say that, who say, actually, our job as Christians is to talk about God, not 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 political engagement? What would you say to that? Well, they are combined. You know, if we if we believe as as we do that, you know, people are equal. And, um, you know, and and look at the work that Jesus did when he talked about inequality and when he talked about poverty, then then surely there is a duty on us to try and do what we can to alleviate poverty and injustice. And and for some, that can be the practical work that many do out in the community, but others that can be getting involved in Parliament, being part of the decision making, because otherwise you're, you know, you're you're always fighting fires. And it's like you said, fighting fires all the time. stop them occurring in the first place let's get further up you know and 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 deal with some of these issues from the very top if that's what if that's what we you know truly believe and 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 everything's political you Mm. know every decision everything we you know everything comes back to politics at some point someone has made a political decision you know we were talking just before but issues around the equality act around uh you know gay marriage these are these are issues that affect everyone but they're political decisions they were made by politicians at some point and I think mm. that you can't separate that and in politics I think 
you know, your values are depending on obviously your you know your background but whatever you do in politics it's values driven isn't it and I think so I, I'd say they're 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 very closely connected in, in my in my opinion but I know it's it because I'm a Methodist and a politician. <laughs> I, I'm just, um, I love that. And I'm just curious, could I ask you something a little more, a little more personal? And I don't, I don't want to trespass, but I'm just curious, um, you, are, you are holding those identities together in your public life around being a, a person of faith and a politician. Um, those things are really connected for you. I love that. How would you describe your, your personal spiritual life right now? Are there practices or patterns that you're committed to on a regular or quasi-regular basis? Are there are there places in your life where you especially feel God's presence or sense God's movement? Just curious about your your own personal life. And, and I know there's you can't separate the personal from the public. But you you know what I mean? Yeah, um, I don't have as much time for spirituality as I would like. Is in time to sit back and reflect and relax. And what I have started doing though is trying to go for. A, I know it sounds a bit, but go for a swim a bit more often. So at the moment, I can book out a pool to swim on my own for a time slot. Because of COVID, they're not allowing more than one family group to go at the same time at the pool in London. So I can go on my own and be there in the swimming pool. And I know it sounds, uh, it might sound strange, but being there on my own, it's very still, it's very quiet, it's very peaceful. And because it's sort of in a basement, it's its almost, the acoustics are, are it, it, it almost feels, you know, I don't know chair you know when you walk in there the acoustics are in a certain way and I find that being in that space and, and I think the of doing when you're just going up and down and um, doing lunch you can kind of gives you time to sort of uh, think and reflect and and probably at that point when I'm on my own and I like to go really early about seven in the morning before I start the day mm. and I have that that peaceful start before the day <laughs> takes off <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a deeply spiritual practice. I think sometimes when we talk, when we think about spirituality, we think sort of, and this this can be like we think open the Bible or say a prayer, and those things are obviously deeply spiritual. But I think there's a spirituality to kind of to ordinary life. I'm a I'm not a swimmer, but I'm a runner, and when I go into the park park path, an app takes about ten minutes, and whatever kicks in the dopamine, the the free drugs from God, but there is something. <laughs> beautiful that I and I feel deeply connected to God and it sounds like a little different for you in the in the pool but there's something something really connective there yeah and I think it's the the fact that you're you're busy in a way you can allow your mind to think while your body's doing something quite rhythmical as in you know you're swimming or you're running or you're doing something in that way but you've got that space and time and it's that being alone and I'm never um or rarely ever alone with my job because you know, obviously got the children and my partner and um, work and and but that time is like a is just on my own. So probably only get to do it two mornings a week, but it's it's nice when I do. That's great. It's like your own little your own little cell in the monastery, right? Like it's just it's just <laughs> it's your pool. I love that. I can imagining the acoustic acoustic reverberations there. Wonderful. Your own little your own little cell. Your own little chapel. Wonderful. And a pool. That's great. It, 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 it's a good place. Yeah. I read when I was preparing for our conversation, I read uh, I an interview or listened to an interview, but you, you were talking about how um, Christianity was your grandparents' faith. Methodism was your grandparents' faith. And then you talked about um, you discovered church fresh as a young, young adult when you, when you had children. And um which is, I think a lot of people can probably identify with that. There's something you want your kids to have a, a rooting in God and in love and in community. Um, but you obviously cared about children before you had children. You're, you're a teacher, you love children, and you've done as an MP amazing work around the, the hopes and needs of, of children. I was reading about a great partnership with the Methodist Church in, in whole, uh, the Reuniform Project where y'all worked together to get, I think a thousand plus kids school uniforms who are having a hard time affording those. So um, children is like a, a, a golden thread that runs through all these parts of your life. And I'm curious, why do you think, I mean, maybe it seems like sort of an obvious question, but I just want to ask it. Why do you think children are so important for you? They're, they're just, as I say, they're just, they're just great. I mean, anyone who's worked <laughs> with really, really small children, they're just fab. And there's, they have so much joy 
and so much sort of especially when you work with small children all their emotions are on display and there's none of that sort of cynicism that we get as we get older and we get a bit more cynical and children can be just joyful or they can be upset but their emotions are all there and I think it's something very special about working with small children and and, and you can almost see the little person that they're growing to grow up to be from just that very young age and to have a small part in sort of shaping that and I think it comes back to the you know leave the world in a better place than we found it how much better is it through the influence we have upon children who are going to be you know growing up and and being in charge of the world when we're all we're all much older and and I think it's just I've always enjoyed it I mean even when I was younger I used to do my my younger sister's five years younger and so I used to do her birthday parties and her birthday parties for all her friends. I'd sort of organise all the parties for them and do things like that because um, just because I just found it really fun. And then when I was at university, I obviously worked in a children's nursery, which was really cute because it was from six weeks old. She so had lots of baby cuddles. Oh, it, was just, it, was, it was really lovely. Um, and then, not, then I wanted to obviously go into infants. But I think in politics I've tried to talk more about the children who get ignored and forgotten so particularly children with special needs and disabilities mm. tried to talk a lot about those children because lots of policies and decisions are made and I, I feel too many times children with special needs and disabilities are an afterthought and if one example of this was the testing regime that they introduced in schools you know when the children all had to have the tests to go back to school yeah. and they hadn't thought about children with special needs and disabilities and how would they cope with having these invasive tests and not being able to understand where they were happening you know these these things need to be I think we need to stop thinking about them you know as a secondary uh, decision and actually thinking of them from the from the very beginning that if we're going to introduce testing regime well how is that going to play out for children with disabilities or mm. children mm. on the autistic spectrum or you know, how are we going to make schools a, a safe space for those children and I, and I just felt they were not considered uh, in the way they should have been uh, yeah. at the time. Obviously, your whole your whole career and a lot of your political career has been sort of advocating for for for, for kids, and and that's that's a wonderful um, uh, current uh, question. Um, I'm I'm always wanting to sort of flip the script a little bit. So we have a lot to to do to care for children as a society. But um, there's a great line from one of my favorite lines, actually, from the Bible, which is where the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament is like looking to the future, which he thinks is God's future and imagining a time where everybody has what they need, where there is justice and well-being for all the people. And he says of that beloved community that he's describing, that he imagines God is bringing into being, he says of that community, a little child will lead them. And so I was just thinking about, it is, our, it is our responsibility to care for children, but there's also, I think the prophets are saying, actually, it's not just care for them, let them lead you. And I was just curious, you, an MP in parliament, what, what's a lesson over your life that a lesson on leadership that a child has taught you? Oh gosh. Um... I think they, they, it's a really hard one. I think they judge less children, don't they? Mm. They take people much more as they see them and they're a lot less judgmental. And there's, there's many of those pictures saying, you know, when they're, then they're little, they just accept things. And I remember it with my, with my daughter um, at school, she's got uh, friends of all different faiths and some of her friends are uh, Muslim and so therefore they're vegetarians. So when, um, when my stepdaughter became a vegetarian, my youngest said to her, oh, are you a Muslim now? And she <laughs> didn't really understand because for her, it was, you know, these are, and I think we have that level of acceptance. They just accept the world as is. They don't really think about it. So there's no, there's less prejudice, I suppose. There's less, um, there's less preconceptions. They just see things as, well, you know, my little friends who are all this, they're all vegetarians and therefore that's what we must all be if we're vegetarian you know they don't and I quite like that innocence in the way of looking at the world that they're not thinking of you know and I think that's nice of just trying to take people take people as they are and not you know and and judge people I think with uh and try well try not to be judgmental or preconceived ideas or perceptions about how people should be or how they shouldn't be 
Yeah, love that. We should, I'm imagining we should get some kids into the House of Commons and the Lords and all of our churches and, and say, teach us that kids, because I think that's right. Like, let's lower our judgmentalism. Let's lower all of our kind of uh, preconceptions. And uh, that would be amazing. Can you imagine like a, from the speaker's, speaker's chair, you know, like a kid saying, now, friends, here's some things we need to learn together as a nation. <laughs> why they're so brilliant I mean and that was what we were working with them that they they just they don't have that preconception they don't have that idea of of how people should be they just have that you know and and I'm just talking to my sister she's she was worrying about her daughter and you know when they're little are they going to have friends and are they going to find the night you know white people and I was saying but when they're little the great thing about small children is they even before they have these firm relationships they'll just play where they want to play so they want to play in the sandpit, they'll play with whoever's there. They want to play in the water, they'll play with whoever's there. You know, wherever they want to go, whoever's there, they'll just play with them. And I love that. You know, this, you know, you, <laughs> but they'll just, you know, if they want to play with it, they'll go and join the people there and they'll do it. And you see it in the park with small, you know, they'll, and that idea of there's no judgment, there's no this and the other. It's like, oh, you, you know, they'll just go and want to do something together. And I think that's great. Oh, wouldn't that be amazing? Just play together, play together. Stop throwing your toys out of the pram. Just play together. I love it. <laughs> yeah. to the adults to the adults. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, I love that. So much to learn from those who who see the world through those kind of uh, non non judgmental eyes. So much to learn from those kids. Um, these past several years, obviously, uh, while painful times, uh, political division, social division. Um, obviously COVID, so painful, so much challenge, also so much beauty leaking through, a people shot through, people, you know, showing up for each other and, and, and serving, serving each other. So just a mix of, of challenge and beauty. I'm just, as an MP, you see this firsthand all the time. And I'm just curious, what has constituency work been like for you over the past few years? What's it like serving people in your area? What are you hearing as you're knocking doors? It's, it's been it's been difficult it's been a very mixed I think this is this is a thing with the pandemic it's not been an equal pandemic uh last night I was late back getting a train um and I was got a taxi and I was talking to the taxi driver and he was telling me what a, a difficult time he's had because of course no one was going anywhere there's no business for taxi drivers and they're registered as self-employed he was only able to get a um, you know really small amount of money he had no income whatsoever during during this time other than you know this, this small grant he was able to obtain and you compare that to uh you know lots of other people I know like my my sister what I've got two sisters my older sister you know who was able to work from home continue to earn the money that she had done before and actually save a lot of money because they weren't going out and they weren't using you know going out for meals and they weren't socializing and so she's ended up saving all this money and having yes she's been at home working which isn't ideal but, you know, relatively speaking, uh, it, it's not been bad for her. And then the taxi driver who's nearly uh, gone bankrupt and he said he had to take his pension early. He's had to get rid of all of his savings to try and get himself through this difficult time because he had no income whatsoever. So I think it, it's been such an uneven pandemic in the way that it's impacted, impacting people. And the problems of the mental health tend to be driven by financial. People have had a really difficult a really difficult year aside from you know the, the losses that some have had and we've we've seen such a difference as well in, in you know you look at retail staff I mean in Hulworth and Hesel there's, there's lots of people working still in face-to-face -face industries and so they've had to keep going out there and it's been it's been hard people working in retail have found it difficult people working still in manufacturing so I think it, it, it's it's very I think people's experiences have been incredibly different yeah. Um, and certainly in an area like this, it's been a, I think it's been a challenging year for a lot of people. I was, I was just thinking about like, you know, you mentioned people come to you and, and you, 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 you promise to try to help, but you can't promise that you will be able to sort things out. I was just thinking for, for any politician, I guess, but particularly, well, for any politician who's working uh, out of a place of calling, uh, it must be so difficult to have this vision and just and, and also the processes that you're trying to work are so slow sometimes, particularly, you know, when when you're in opposition, you know, all these kinds of things. What what are you when you hear those stories from the cabbie or from other folks, you know, 
what what do you say to them? Uh, you know, uh, is there a message of hope that you feel like you can say in good conscience, or wh what do you say to them? It's difficult because you don't. I've, I've learned you can't give people false hope in saying that you'll be able to solve their problem because I think in the past, you know, I've learned in the short time I've been an MP, well, four years I've been an MP is. It's, it's really difficult trying to solve some of the problems that uh, people face. And as you say, the systems are laboriously slow. I mean, you can just offer to try. And, and there are, one thing I will say about areas like this, there are lots of small charities and organisations that you get to know that can help with lots of different uh, things. So, for example, there's like this amazing charity called Bundles of Joy, which is this tiny one, which gives out free stuff for babies, for families who... Um, you, you know, need it. So including nappies, wipes, but it could be prams, it could be whatever families need. So when we've, so we've been able to, when families have come to us, especially those with no recourse to public funds, when they've been having children and they and they have no income at all, we were able to direct them to these organisations. So I suppose in terms of hope, the hope is is that good people are trying to do bits in the community to help. But, you know, my opinion is that should come from the government as well and, and not just be reliant on on uh, the amazing volunteers that we have in the area trying to make a difference. That's really powerful. And I, I thank God for all those good news stories, even when there's political intractability and things aren't moving. Thank God for all those good news stories. Um, and as, as you say, it's not it shouldn't be only their responsibility. It should you know, we have a responsibility regardless of our party, in my opinion, to, you know, for the, for, to protect the, 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 particularly the vulnerable. So, but thank God for those good news stories of people who are doing that stuff, even in the stuck times. It, it must be, I, I imagine, I'm not an MP, I'm, I've never been in politics, but I imagine it must be quite difficult for you personally to be trying to change the system. And it's, there's so many setbacks and, and it's so slow. How do you, you know, how do you stay motivated through that? I think we, we share, I've got an amazing team um, that I work, uh, work with and we try and share the good news and we get a real buzz when we have a good, when we have a win, Amen. we're really pleased. <laughs> when we, yeah, when we've managed to sort housing out for someone or, you know, we've solved a problem, even this lady in this nightmare tree she had, um, you know, whatever it might be, it's nice. We try and share the positives and try and share the wins. And, and I think sometimes it's it's baby steps towards the goal that we're trying to achieve. And, you know, and sometimes we get there and sometimes it's a setback. But I think it's about not giving up. I think just because we've had a setback or just because I haven't we haven't got the change that we wanted first time doesn't mean we won't. And that's why I tend to always think about it. We, you know, we haven't got to the end yet. You know, there's always a there's another way. And I tend to be quite um, tenacious. You think, well, if we've not got there yet, let's, and this is what I used to probably do as a teacher, and it's the same kind of thing. It's, a, you know, we just got to keep going and we just got to keep trying. We've got to do something else. And uh, I'm re recognizing when I do get to the point where I am just really tired, making sure I do try and take some time to relax. And I did this summer, I took some time to relax a bit so you can come back fresh. And I think, you know, the usual things that people do to try and keep going. But I think it's that just because someone says no doesn't mean it's the end. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Polit politically, it, someone said once of the Christian story, if it's bad news, it's not the end. You know, there is, if, if we're, in, if we're in a tough time, that's not the end. The end is something we hope, we pray, we're looking on the horizon uh, for something much more glorious and just. So if it's bad, it's not the end, but still hard. That's why you need the swimming. That's why you need the time off and you need all those, all those, when you get the wins to celebrate them well. Um, yes. It's a truism to say we're a divided country. Um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously, uh, I live in Britain, I'm American. America is a divided country. Lots of division in, in, in lots of countries right now. And obviously in those divided country, people of goodwill, I believe, have different political beliefs. But on a good day, I, at least I believe on a good day, many people across parties, Labour supporters, Tories, Lib Dems, Greens, S&Ps, Independents, et cetera, do on a good day want the common good for everybody. So, you know, um, I realize you, you're a labor MP, so, you know, you have, you have a take on that. I'm curious, for, for folks who are trying to do that cross-party bridge-building work for the common good, while also staying rooted in their principles and values, as you said, what's, what's your advice for them? 
I think we are divided, but there are, you know, nobody's black and white. And, and I find that there's lots of these groups called these all party parliamentary groups, which tend to be groups which are more about specific issues. So I'm on one for oracy and I'm on one for apprenticeships and, you know, ones that are more almost there's lots of health ones as well so can, ones around regarding cancer research or Parkinson's you know I'm on one for endometriosis so on issues like that which are less overtly party political which are less about you know universal credit or, or, or something very party political you can find quite a lot of common ground and I talk about the endometriosis one which is a, a condition women can have the, con the it's a conservative chair and I'm the vice chair but we and we have many different opinions on many things outside of this issue and we vary when it comes to looking at our voting records but on this issue because of because we've had constituents come to us we work together really well because we both believe that it's important that this is a condition gets uh, gets more research and there's an awareness is raised about it and so i saw him just the other day and he said oh good news you know emma we need to find out who the new who the new health minister is and make sure we invite them to our meeting and i was like yes let's do that he says we'll sign send the letter together and i said this is in the corridor i said brilliant let's do that together and so the i find that we've we've with people just because you you know you're in a different uh, party doesn't mean there aren't ways in which you agree so there's one we both agree that raising this awareness of a health condition for women is really important as a small issue on apprenticeships um i'm, la I'm labor mp there's a conservative mp we chair the thing together because we both believe apprenticeships are really important so i find you know everyone sees pmqs and shouting and all the sort of you know the panto um but what isn't seen is when you work together and I find as an op opposition MP if you want to make changes that's when you've got to find allies in different parties to work together with you on certain issues to push because you know the government is more likely to look at something that's come from a variety of conservative Labour MPs working together on something and 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 that's what that's what we try that's what we try and do so it's, it's just probably not as visible because it's probably not as uh, interesting <laughs> for newspapers to look at. Yeah, not the panto. I love that. That's a great. That's a great description of of sometimes PMQs. But yeah, it's not it's not the drama, but it's, it's yeah. But it's the real stuff too. It, it strikes me, Emma, that that's really good. It, that that might be a really good kind of advice or top tip for local communities. So like if you're a church, or and you're wanting to do work with your neighborhood mosque and the neighborhood, you know, school and the neighborhood synagogue or, and people of no faith that, that maybe a top tip is like the fine thing that you can all, it's all in your self interest or you can all agree on and work on that, work on that. Would you say that's it? Is that right? Absolutely. And and that's what we've done with Reuniform, which was done with the Methodist Church. So the, the volunteers involved in that are not all from the church. Some are, in fact, some of them I knew from my days in the teachers union. Some are ex-teachers who have no faith at all. Some are from the Methodist Church. Uh, some are more from a political background. But we, everyone's working together on this idea of trying to get school uniform out to as many families as possible in the area and and they all work together on that because that's something they can all support and it's now become this amazing group of volunteers that I don't think would have come together in a different situation and I find you know we've I, I just find when I meet someone and I did this um <laughs> talking to this to we we'll have a um a, a opinionated presenter from GB News um and he said we'll find the bit that we can I try to find with everyone what's the bit that we can agree on and then we can sort of then it well you can find a link with somebody else and, and what's the bit where we can work together on and and so I'll, I'll happily work with any conservative mp on an issue that i think is important um and and i think it takes the personal out as well mm. because you're not saying this person is an you know awful person it's like well this person has different views to me it's a slightly different way of looking at it because you can have I think it's I think it's kind of healthy to have friends who might have different political opinions I think so too I think so too um, and that makes for one that makes for great pub conversations <laughs> <laughs> two, it, as you say it presses you to think about what's the common thing what's the common value that we share and we do share things you know and and then to to focus on that um as well as enjoy the enjoy the the um you know, the spirited disagreement at the pub, I mean, that's okay too, you know. I like arguing with my friends of different political uh, persuasions, that's cool, but uh, 
it doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't, as fun as it is, that doesn't get like, that doesn't make communities better, right? That doesn't necessarily um, uh, do the things communities are, are, are begging for us to do as, as political leaders or as, as religious institutions. Yeah, but I think in that issue of division, and I was looking at some polling which was showing that, um, you know, in America is more divided than, than we are. I think one of the things it was talking about is people would only so people are more likely to associate and spend time with people with the same political opinions. And I think so here on, on the Brexit example, mm. um, you know, members of my family voted Brexit, members of my family voted Remain. And I think that's been quite good that you've had these different opinions from people who, you know, who I love all of them. They're all part of my family and they all felt differently about this issue. And I think if we want to try and do something about division, then we need to spend time, I think, sometimes with people who feel differently to us about some of these issues and recognise that, you know, because someone has a different opinion doesn't make them a, a bad person. It means they've got a different opinion. Right. I'm not I'm a politician. It's my job to convince them, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but to expect, I think, yeah, absolutely. But to expect that they might try to convince you and to be open to that testimony, right? I mean, I think echo chambers are death dealing places, um, oh. you know, in my opinion. And so I think to, we got to open the room up and, 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 and let the air in. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so that's the issue I think with social media is if we only ever see or hear from people who agree with us. And um, I always remember this when I was getting, getting my nails done and the, and I was been looking at Twitter the night before, which was all full of, I don't know, whatever the latest politics was came out and, and the girl doing my nails said, oh, did you see it? Did you see it on Twitter last night? And I said, oh, what was it? She went, oh, have you seen what? The, I said, my timeline was full of the Kardashians. And I just thought it's quite funny. <laughs> completely, we were both on at the same time, but she's got a timeline full of the Kardashians and I've got this timeline full of, and I, because, you know, because we, we're only given information that obviously they think we're interested in. But I, I, I thought that really sort of highlighted how different you can go on the same social media platform but see completely different oh. uh, things throughout it that's that that strikes me because like obviously i care about church I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an evangelist i'm a, someone who cares about starting new churches and you're a politician you so we work in these kind of spaces different spaces which are important but most people don't care what happens <laughs> in those rooms they're not saying they're not important they just they're not following it and yet our our work is for those people and with those people. So like, you know, I think it, for me, at least it's a it's a real wake up call to like not to say this. This stuff is unimportant. And obviously what happens in the House of Commons is very important. But we have to remember this is about human beings who have diverse lives, who love the Kardashians and sport and dancing and other everything else we all love. You know, I think that's that's what it's for. It's about people. Uh, absolutely and I mean like I've been oh you know we've all been in politics gossiping and whispering about the reshuffle and who's got this position and who's got that position and what happened to this one after nobody outside Westminster <laughs> asked me one question about it no one no one no one cares um you know and not even like my sisters or anyone you think would be saying oh have you seen nothing nothing at all um <laughs> and, but towards it you know and it's recognizing that yeah out there it's not yeah. it's a bubble thing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, i know we got about f four or five minutes left i just want to ask you a couple one one more question and then invite you to say a word to, to leave us with but um we at hope and anchor we like to try to encourage people to try new things to take risks to experiment and innovate and and, and risk love risk justice all that good stuff and we know sometimes when you take a risk, it goes beautifully, it goes to plan. And sometimes we fall flat on our faces. It doesn't go well. And I'm just curious, would you be willing to share a time? You've got lots of wins in your column. You've got amazing stuff on your CV. Would you be willing to share a time where you tried your best and it did not go to plan? Things went wrong. What went wrong and what did you learn? Oh, well, I mean, I've, I've, I've gone wrong in, in the House of Commons before, stood up and made a complete fool of myself. Mm -hmm. And I just remember, oh, it's still embarrassing now, of the, the I was a new MP and the Secretary of State just looking at me, like utter disdain, like, who is this woman who's bumbled through this? So I've had those, I've had those moments when you, 
normally you only obviously want to share the ones where you're articulate and clear and passionate and not the ones when you go oh um uh, <laughs> 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 like that because you just stood up and made a bit of a fool of yourself so I've had a few of those a few of those moments when your mind just goes blank and you yeah. think I can't uh yeah I, I've got no idea what I'm saying so yeah they, they've been they happen but I mean most people are sort of forgiving forgiving of that because it's kind of happened to everybody and and you know I, I think we can all be in there be in those moments where you've things have just gone gone really wrong <laughs> It's really humanizing, I think, just to hear an MP. Thank you for sharing that. To say, like, yeah. I really, I really, it just does not go well on the floor. That is so humanizing. I mean, I, I would, I yeah. trust a leader who can say that about herself or himself, uh, rather than someone who tries to spin it. So, thank you. That's wonderful. We've all been there. We've all been there. All right. Last yeah. thing, you got to go. But um, I just wanted to imagine you're in the House of, of Commons. Some big votes happening. You come out. Masses of people are outside in the square. Um, they're there rallying people of all different faiths, political persuasions, and they're gathered all in one place. And for some reason, they invite you to get up on the stage and they give you the mic and say, give us a word, cross party, cross faith, give us a word, give us a benediction, give us a challenge to go back to our communities uh, to do something different. What would what would, what would be your, your sentence? What would be your, your challenge? What would be your... Your, your blessing? I think that we're all more powerful than we realize and we can all have a huge impact on the people we meet and see around us. And we should use that power and that influence and that we have in each and every one of us to try and make the world a better place. And everyone can do something, whether that's going home, checking on your neighbor, joining a political party, campaigning for a cause, contacting a member of parliament, getting interested in what's happening in local politics, going to your church, getting seeing a community group, being a volunteer, each and every one of us. And we can create, and if someone imagines it, like the pebble falling in the pond mm. by making this one difference, we don't know where the ripples are going to end and how much influence we can have on others. So I think rather than always looking for the answer for someone to come down with the answer, look what we can do, because everyone can do something. I love it. I can see people going off to their tube stations charged up by that, Emma Hardy. Emma Hardy, <laughs> thank you so much for being with us today at Hope and Anchor. Grateful for your time and bless you and your colleagues across parties in your service to this to this country. Thank you so much.